spend the next hour or so bring you a, a PRI webinar on the subject of responsible investment in private debt. So a very warm welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Archie Beeching. I'm head of private markets at PRI, um, and uh, we'll be moderating today's webinar. Uh, just some quick housekeeping for you today. This slide shows the uh, the options for connecting to the audio. Obviously, if you're not connected, you won't be able to hear me, but hopefully you can see the options here to, to log in via phone or via computer. Uh, most importantly, we really want this to be an interactive session, so please do um, click on the Q&A button in the bottom toolbar if you haven't already got that, and then in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you should see the Q&A option. So type in questions there. Um, we will see those, and we will pick out your questions once all the speakers have had a chance to um, answer my initial questions. But um, don't wait for them to finish. Please do, do type in your questions whenever they come to you. Uh, I really hope you enjoy this webinar. There will be a recording available as soon as we can get that edited and up on our website over the next week or so. Um, and we will send any further information to everyone who's attending and also those who weren't able to attend. Just quickly, the agenda for today. Um, I will quickly introduce our speakers. We'll talk briefly about the report that PRI launched last week on this topic, and then I'll launch into a moderated discussion with our four speakers, and then turn to the audience for questions before a wrap-up. So very quickly, here are our four speakers for today. Um, I'm really delighted to have a good range of speakers representing an asset owner, and three asset managers from the US, the UK, and France that invested a range of alternative credit strategies. We have Diane Drasubia, Head of Responsible Investment at the National Employment Savings Trust in the UK, or NEST, as some of you may know it. We have Richard Sherry, Fund Manager at M&G, also in the UK. And then we have Christopher Cox from the US. He is Senior Managing Director and Chief Risk Officer at Churchill Asset Manager. And we have Mark Guyot, Head of ESG at LBO France, as you might have guessed, in France. So just to give you a bit of context before I, I start with some questions for our speakers, I want to give you a, a flavor of the report we've just published, but I won't go into great detail. Um, it's, it's a short and easy to read report, and I hope you will, will get a chance to read that over the coming weeks. Um, less than a week ago, here I launched our first report on responsible investment in private debt. Very little has been published on this subject from uh, the NGO world or the investor world. Um, we felt there was a bit of a knowledge gap on good practices in this asset class, so we're very excited to be breaking new ground here. Our objectives in researching and writing this report were to explain what responsible investment means in the context of private debt, explaining all the nuance for different um, private debt strategies that are out there. Uh, we wanted to identify, if there is any, and highlight examples of current RI practices and good practice amongst private debt investors. Uh, we wanted to provide some guidance, if possible, on the actions investors can take to implement the responsible investment in private debt. And we wanted to explore some of the challenges and emerging areas of private debt, such as thematic investing. Just in terms of the methodology, the report was based on interviews with 18 investors, primarily based in the UK and France, representing a range of strategies across private debt, from leverage loans and infrastructure debt to direct lending. And you can find a, a list of those contributors in the report itself. One of the things you'll find in the report is this table. It shows a, uh, a complete deal process from origination to exit and on the table, we suggest responsible investment actions you can take, including incorporating ESG into investment decisions at the due diligence stage and also engagement activity you can take throughout the process. Um, another key thing to look out for, particularly for the LPs on the line, is uh, in the appendix of the report, we've included a due diligence questionnaire. It's designed for LPs looking to appoint an external private debt manager, and the DDQ contains a list of questions that LPs can integrate into their existing due diligence questionnaires. 
And the intention here is to streamline how LPs and GPs communicate on ESG. Any of you familiar with our private equity work will know that we've done this in the private equity space. We're in the process of developing a, a suite of these due diligence questionnaires across private markets, so for infrastructure, real estate, and ultimately farmland and timber as well. Um, so we hope you find that useful. On the PRI website, you will also find three investor case studies which we're looking to add to over time. So please do contact us if um, you'd like to get involved to contribute a case study uh, on the topic of a responsible investment in private debt. Uh, and again, we'll share some contact details at the end of the webinar to get in touch. We're absolutely delighted with the outcomes of the report. I won't say more about it now, but I do encourage you to, to download a copy from our website Again, a, a link will be emailed to you um, in the webinar follow-up. So, on to our speakers. I'm going to start with Dan Drake, and I encourage everyone to send in your questions as and when. Um, Dan Drake, hopefully um, you can hear me and you're off mute. I just want to start by asking you, obviously as an asset owner, um, to tell us a bit about your experiences in developing a new private debt mandate um, and perhaps you explain why ESG and responsible investment is important for NEST generally um, and then tell us about some of the responsible investment or ESG criteria that you consider when selecting a manager. Okay, great. Thanks Archie. Um, so I just would like to say that we're actually in the process of the procurement process for a private debt fund manager. And we're actually looking at private debt in the form of corporate loans, either syndicated and or bilateral loans, infrastructure debt and real estate debt. And we found that each type of sub-asset class really brings its own set of ESG risks and opportunities. So we've had to be really mindful of that when we formulated um, criteria in our, in our RFPs. So at NEST, we've always really embarked on an exhaustive manager selection process and our approach to private debt has really been no different. Um, we put in a range of questions on um, uh, how, ES uh, how fund managers embed ESG within their investment processes. And we actually think ESG is particularly pertinent to this asset class, given the long-term nature of it, the fact that loans need to generally be held to maturity, it's very difficult, very difficult to sell a bond early, um, and it's generally illiquid. So we really feel that ESG risks are, you know, have the potential to really materialize if they're not analyzed and detected properly. So this is why we kind of felt that we wanted to have a sort of pass-fail question within our initial screening questionnaire. We actually asked about fund managers' um, approach to embedding ESG in their investment process. And for those fund managers who didn't demonstrate an adequate response to that, they were eliminated from the process quite early on. Um, I'm quite pleased to say that very, there were very few disqualifications quite early on that because I feel that the responses that came back, there was um, a good demonstration of understanding of ESG within the asset class and many of the fund managers were able to really um, you know, articulate how they're embedding ESG within their due diligence process, within the source, within the origination um, of deals and their um, ongoing credit analysis and monitoring and a lot of them were actually showing willingness to engage with the borrowers and sponsors um, of the deals as well. So we were quite impressed with the level of understanding and the um, approaches being undertaken. Um, the private debt market is quite complex and heterogeneous, which reflected the fact that managers do have varying approaches, and we were quite happy for for fund managers to really deploy their own styles and deploy their own sort of approach for how they address ESG within that. So um, even though it was quite difficult to compare fund managers against one another, we, we were quite happy that, um, that fund managers just show and demonstrate that they're actually doing this to a really, really high standard. And um, you know, we really believe that embedding ESG really enhances the quality of their offering, and that's particularly important for NEST. So um, just with regard to why this is important for NEST, ESG has always been core to our investment approach and the way that we've run money for members. Um, managing ESG risks and heeding, uh, heeding ESG um, opportunities uh, for us is absolutely about enhancing risk-adjusted returns for members. And we, we have this kind of requirement across all asset classes and mandates 
where relevant and where and where practical. And, and as I said earlier, I think private debt is absolutely ripe for the management of ESG and the ability to harness um, uh, social and environmental impact opportunities, particularly within the real estate and infrastructure space as well. So the type of criteria that, that we kind of you know put in place, um, and I think I'm now that we've been through, you know, we're kind of nearing the end of the process. I can I can really sort of put in, you know, sort of set out what I think um, could be determined to be sort of some best practice thinking in the space. I think it's it's really absolutely um, imperative that fund managers demonstrate um, their RI philosophies of the firm and how that's kind of embedded down to their private debt strategies, really show demonstration for ESG um, analysis within their due diligence process, um, how they're communicating those risks and analysis to their investment committee. So we think that there should be um, ESG and analysis within the memorandums that go to the IC and um, ESG should absolutely form part of the investment committee approval for a deal. Um, we also expect ESG analysis to be part of the, the credit ongoing monitoring. So throughout the length of the loan, because loans can be you know very, very long term, it's quite difficult to sell. We expect the fund managers to demonstrate how they're monitoring risks um, throughout the length of the loan demonstrate engagement with, um, with sponsors or the borrowers about um, management of ESG risks. Um, at the outset, during the sourcing of the loans, if there are risks, we would ask them to demonstrate that or, or ask the question whether or not they actually set out what the risks are and how they could be managed within the loan documentation. So there are a number of high-level things that we, that we think fund managers could be doing um, you know, on this, and I think there were definitely some common common ground on due diligence and ongoing monitoring and engagement that I think could form part of best practice. But um, we're absolutely you know, pleased that our managers you know, do retain flexibility and tailor their ESG approach um, around the investment strategy that they're proposing. Um, just more broadly, um, we've also started to ask questions around um, sort of broader issues like fund managers' diversity, um, within their investment houses and how that articulates and it feels us down to the team that's managing money for us. We, we want the team that's managing money to us to have a very strong culture and be quite diverse, not because you know we're nice people and we're forcing the agenda, but because we think it absolutely enhances decision making and leads to high quality and better decision making um, for finesse and, and other clients. So. We're asking more broader questions about diversity, and when we're having these meetings, we, we want to see a room um, with people that are from different backgrounds and you know, have something to add to the process, and there's variety and diversity in the types of people that are managing money for us. Um, we, we also think that you know, Nest is a climate-aware investor. Um, physical climate risk is a, is a particularly pertinent issue within infrastructure debt, for example, and, and real estate debt. So we ask a question on, you know, how, how the fund manager is managing um, energy efficiency issues within property, um, infrastructure, for example, what, what type of analysis they're doing on where those assets are located, what type of physical climate risk could that asset be exposed to. So, you know, we also ask questions and, and put in expectations around the things that NEST is also interested in. So, um, climate change is definitely one of them and, and social issues as well. Um, but we can talk about impact a little bit later. I'm just kind of aware that I've been speaking now for quite a few minutes. So, um, I'll, I'll leave it there, Archie, and if there's any, any follow-up questions. <coughs> Andrew, thank you. I'm happy to let you you go on. That's all fascinating. A lot of information there for any aspiring yeah. manager, and, and um, very interesting to hear how Nest approaches this. So thank you so much for that. So I'd, I'd certainly want to come back to you, Deandre, and I want to give the audience a, a chance to ask any questions. Um, for now, we're just going to move on to Richard Cherry from M&G. Um, so, Richard, we have the pleasure of Richard's company in the office here in London. So thank you for coming to see us. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could tell us that one of the things we spent quite a lot of time on with this report was getting our heads around private debt, not as a homogenous thing, but really as a, a, a large range of different investment strategies. Um, so perhaps you could tell us a bit about the difference between your ESG approach 
um, to leverage loans versus private debt and, and across different areas um, or different strategies. Um, and really tell us more generally what ESG integration means to M&G in this space in regards to your day job. Right. Um, at m and um, we're involved in, uh, I guess, a very broad range of, of, of private debt markets, and and uh, they all um, uh, have, have, have their own quirks and, 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 and their own ways of working. So while you can make some broad generalizations about private debt, uh, things do work differently in different parts of the market. Now, for example, um, we're, we're involved in leveraged loans, private placements, real estate debt, private infrastructure debt, uh, even private ABS. And uh, you know, a, a lot of the times the, the, the transactions we, we're involved in are, are bilateral transactions or small club deals. Uh, so, so in those type of, of, of transactions, um, you're, I guess, very close to the borrower and very important to the borrower because, because often you're, you're, you're their main source of finance. Uh, when you're looking at, at areas of market like, like leverage loans, this is probably the the largest and most liquid part of, of, of private debt markets where the, where the dynamics are, are, are slightly different. Um, now, um, so, so, so I guess when, when you're looking at leverage loans um, as an example, um, you, you've also got the, the, the equity sponsors involved. So, so you need to have a, a clear understanding of, of, of the equity sponsors' ESG um, policies and processes. Um, you, you're often making investment in that market at the time of a, of a, of a new acquisition where, where, where the ownership changes. So, so, so you need to understand uh, what the new owners intend to do and what, what their, their, their attitude and policy to ESG are so so in those circumstances as well as doing your, your, your due diligence on, on on the actual company you're doing due diligence on on, on the equity sponsor um, if we're looking in other parts of the market say say bilateral direct lending where you, where it's really just just us and the borrower um, then um, we find that's very much a, a, a close relationship based type um, type of arrangement um, so um, you, you generally negotiate these transactions over a period of many months, um, you, you you develop quite a close relationship with the company. You have lots of opportunity to engage. Uh, so, so I think uh, um, in, in in that type of market, uh, we, you're often dealing with smaller companies, so they may may not have all the ESG information that that you're used to if you're dealing public markets. However, you have much better access and much better ability to to discuss the the key issues that, that, that concern you with, with with the company. So so in, in some ways in private markets, even though there's less information available, uh, this uh, this uh, better access means that that you can often uh, really get um, a deep understanding of what what's important to you in terms of in terms of ESG issues. Um, <clears throat> Now, I guess um, uh, more broadly as well, um, just just explaining my role at M&G, I'm, I'm a fund manager and, and, and I manage uh, what we call multi-asset strategies in private debt. So, so, so my funds invest in in, in all these areas that that, that that I mentioned, from from leverage loans to direct lending and private placements, real estate debt, infrastructure debt. Uh, we're also very active in social housing in the UK. Uh, so, so, so my funds sort of touch across all of these different areas, and and, and one thing that, that that we noticed was that um, there's there's lots of opportunity for uh, impact investments in this space, uh, lots of opportunity to 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 make investments in in in, in companies or projects with a with an environmental or social benefit. So, uh, whether that be um, uh, so, a lot of the reason for that is in, in, in private debt markets, you're often financing a discrete projects so you could be financing uh, something like a, a, a the new wind farm or a, a solar park on the infrastructure side you could be financing the construction of new social housing or a new hospital or uh, university facilities um, so so you can really get to very pure play impact assets in this space or if you're financing corporate loans um, either through direct lending or, or, or leverage loan markets these tend to be smaller companies, which are more often pure play. So again, a lot of um, impact opportunities. So, so, so as well as following an integrated ESG approach in our in our credit process in private debt, uh, we, we also manage impact strategies, packaging together the assets from all these different uh, private debt asset classes into into environmental and social impact strategies. 
Richard, thank you for that insight. That's excellent. Um, again, we'd like to come back to you for, for further questions, but for now, we're going to um, hand over to Chris Cox from Churchill. Um, Chris has put together some slides for us today. Um, and Chris, I just wonder if you could introduce these um, along the lines of these questions. First of all, what kind of investments do you make and, and why is ESG important? Um, keen to hear whether you see uh, or sense a, a different approach to ESG in the States um, that we might see here in Europe. Um, I want to know how the team approaches ESG due diligence in a practical sense. Um, so if you start off with that and, and, and anything else you want to cover, please just give me a shout when you want me to um, move on to the next slide. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Archie. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Thank you, Chris. Great. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think it's probably best just to start with a few words about Nuveen and Churchill Asset Management, so everyone understands really what we do. Churchill's an affiliate of Nuveen, um, and I'm on slide two in my deck. Um, Churchill's an affiliate of Nuveen, which is one of the largest global diversified asset managers in the world, with $930 billion in assets under management. Nuveen is building a platform to serve investors today and in the future with a broad range of strategies, including alternative investment platforms like Churchill, in order to diversify its equity and fixed income holdings. Naveen has been committed to responsible investing for decades, uh, making an important tenet of the firm's strategy, driving these commitments across all investment strategies, inclu including private credit and Churchill. As an affiliate, and I'm moving to slide three, please. As an affiliate um, of Naveen, Churchill sits within Naveen private markets, which manages $52 billion across private financing, senior middle market loans, and junior capital. Churchill is a dedicated platform for private credit investing in senior secured loans, primarily to middle market companies owned by private equity firms. We were formed in 2006 and since inception have closed more than 550 middle market transactions, totaling more than $9.5 billion. We currently manage more than $6 billion of committed capital. Uh, Moving to the next slide, um, you know, as I said, Nuveen and all of its investment strategies, including Churchill, take, you know, a commitment to responsible investing seriously. Our goal is always to deliver superior returns while at the same time upholding the highest ethical standards, including ESG factors that can impact investment performance. We believe that a sound ESG practice um, and, and policy can contri contribute to long-term performance and can help reduce investment risk and it ensures that our investors' capital is used effectively and ethically. On the next slide, um, you'll see, uh, you know, we at Churchill have implemented an ESG policy with the assistance of our colleagues on the Naveen Responsible Investing Team to make sure that we integrate ESG factors throughout the investment life cycle. Our private uh, credit middle market allows us to conduct thorough due diligence prior to making each investment, giving our investment teams access to management and the necessary information they need to identify ESG issues and to evaluate ESG-related risks. Our investment teams complete our ESG checklist during due diligence, which is part of our policy, and the checklist is included in every investment committee memo so that ESG is part of all investment committee discussions and decisions regarding each investment. ESG is also a part of our portfolio monitoring process. If an ESG issue is uncovered during due diligence, but we felt was being dealt with appropriately by the company and we proceeded with the investment, we would carefully monitor the issue after closing with reports and updates to our investment committee at our quarterly portfolio reviews or more frequently as needed. Our loan documents also require that borrowers report material ESG-related events so that, we can, so that we're informed of issues and we can monitor corrective action accordingly. Now, if you look at the next slide six, um, I'll give some examples of, of ESG in practice at Churchill. In one situation during ESG due diligence, the investment team uncovered 
a serious governance issue with a senior level executive being convicted of securities fraud. While the infraction took place years ago, while he worked in another company, we still felt this was significant enough for us to not invest in the company. In another situation, during ESC due diligence, the investment team uncovered minor environmental issues the company had encountered in the past. After the team conducted thorough due diligence around the issue um, and presented to the investment committee, we felt that the company had taken the necessary steps to correct and monitor the issues so Churchill proceeded with the investment. And as a result, the investment team monitors the situation and gets regular updates from the borrower and provides updates to our investment committee at our quarterly portfolio meetings. In my last example, uh, during ESU due diligence, the investment team uncovered a major ethical issue relating to the manufacture of materials that could be used in the production of cluster bombs or nuclear weapons. The borrower was not able to provide the investment team enough transparency for them to determine if the product's end use um, uh, was uh, against our ethical uh, standards, resulting in us not proceeding with, with the investment. Uh, with respect to your question about, you know, whether, you know, we're seeing different approaches in, in the U.S. than, er than Europe, um, you know, I would say, you know, I think the U.S. is lagging, especially in private credit, you know, with introducing formal ESG um, policies and procedures, but I think, you know, overall we're cap catching up. Um, you know, whether there's any difference in Europe, um, you know, I think that's more of just us, uh, you, you know, catching up. It's, it's, we find it's very important to our investors, um, and also, you know, as mentioned, we, we feel it's very important uh, for Nuveen that we're, um, you, you know, tackling and, and conquering strong, sound ESG policies and procedures. So that's what I have. Chris, thank you so much. Um, great presentation and a lot of detail there, so really appreciate that. Um, again, we'll circulate slides and a recording after this so you can catch up on some of that detail. Um, we're going to come to Mark Guyot now. He's head of ESG at LBO France. Mark, thank you for joining us. A um, couple of questions for you to introduce yourself. Um, I'm interested to know how you overcome some of the information gaps between um, LPs and GPs. And I guess for private markets, there's always going to be a challenge of, of finding ESG data. Um, so I'm keen to hear about any initiatives that you're involved in. I understand that there's a, an initiative in France to address some of these information gaps. Um, so we'd love to hear about that. Um, and relating to that, I'd like to hear about the, the relationship that a lender would have with a potential deal sponsor or equity holder, uh, particularly when you're talking about uh, private equity sponsored businesses. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I will, <clears throat> I will start with and hello to everybody. I will start with a general quick comment is that, um, which is one of our specificities here. We are a private equity firm, LBO France, and we are at the same time, uh, of course, uh, investing in equity in some deals and investing in debt in other deals. So that's first point. Second, we are one of the, today, one of the leading firms as far as ESG is concerned in France. There are other ones, so I'm the boasting around. We are among the leading ones. And um, so we have to be consistent in our overall approach. And so that when we restarted again that activity, that business uh, two years ago, uh, we wanted it to, be, it to be consistent with our overall approach, which is very demanding. So that's point one. And second, the debt that we invest in is debt, well, the debt we provide is debt for LBOs, uh, other LBOs operations. So that's always uh, linked to transactions regarding private equity deals, which means that when debt is concerned, we are senior, of course, to equity when we provide debt. But uh, we know that if the, the companies afterwards have problems, uh, we, even if we are senior, we will have major issues and uh, 
And of course, the upside, which is the interest rate, is not that big. So we have to be very, very strict as well as far as ESG is concerned regarding debt. I'm going to answer your question, but I just want to, 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 to give another old thing. And the other thing is, what is for us uh, ESG or sustainability? Sustainability is sustainable income in a sustainable organization in a sustainable world. So start, when we go on the equity side, we are going to always make sure that, or try to make sure, to work on this thing, that the, the business of the company we invest in, in, in equity, and I come back, I come to the debt in a, in a second, is integrity of the business along the whole chi uh, value chain, upstream, business, downstream, uh, which is with the, the business is robust. And then we see how we can give value to it. Second, we want to see how the company has to go on seeing the future to adapt itself to major social societal changes that are today in a very complex world. So how do they have to anticipate them so that they can remain having, having their license to operate? And so it's for what the thing we want to check. And third, we want to be sure to see how the company is, how is it integrating with all the stakeholders? That's what we do on equity. And of course we will do the same on debt because we want to be consistent. So now I come to your point. How do we get with LPs and GPs? And what, what have we done in France regarding this? Uh, what, what I would like to say is A, uh, ESG is a, today, of course, a major operational issue. And, and, for, and therefore, uh, it's, we can see that many managers in, in companies, you know, have not waited for finance guys to, to cope with it. And what we see is that when we when we we discuss them this issue with them at the board, which are, they are more than happy to do, uh, we will uh, they will have worked on it, and we bring the methodology uh, more experience sometimes, and we help them uh, go on a major issue, which is priorities. I think that's important. Other one are not important. Graduality. Uh, which is, of course, uh, very, very important, and and, pri and priorities, and so uh, we will. Uh, so that and so we want to be sure that whatever we do as a GP towards the company is going to help them with something which is major for them, and try to avoid anything that would mm -hmm. that would not help them, and so. Uh, and at the same time, because private equity now has come a worldwide business with a long chain of trust, going from the very end physical person who is investing in some pension fund somewhere to the very end on the other side, small company or a small medium company in the countryside in France, and we discussed with France, we have to have this whole chain of trust going. And so our duty as GP, whether it's its uh, equity or debt is, of course, to to ensure this and to work as well as we can with the LPs so that we all serve something which has become extremely important in a world that has become totally complex and volatile. So we have to cooperate. That's cooperation. And that's what we. That's what we've tried to do in France. So the first thing we we did is that we work between LP and GPs regarding equity, and I go to that in a minute, to, to, to um, try to figure out how to best work together, and we've issued a recommendation. And, and for those who cannot follow this general recommendation now, we are working uh, in some very specific, sites, uh, specific situations on uh, consistent questionnaires that could be shared by several LPs. And we are going then on the debt side, because we are GP on the debt side, so I'm going to work with my other friends who are GP on the debt side to go and take what we've done on the equity side and try to help them discuss with the L their LPs on the debt side, so debt side LPs and debt side GPs to try to see how we can uh, adapt 
this approach and this questionnaire so that we do what we try to do what we said, the long chain of trust, materiality, priorities, and help at the very end the managers and, and not, not go into some administrative uh, approach which would be contrary to what enormous things they do within their companies. So that's what we do. N ourselves, we are GP in debt. We don't have that many LPs right now because we restarted the, the, the business two years ago and it was through a major agreement with another big company in France, a big insurance company, and, and we, we co-manage with them. So uh, we, don't, we don't have this upstream to LPs, but I will see it through my uh, debt GP friends, like I said a minute ago. However, ourselves, when we invest in, uh, in debt, in other transactions, LBO transactions that are managed by other sponsors, we will have, um, we will have due diligence in three steps. A, we do a due diligence on the sponsor because we are very, of course, we are very experienced what a sponsor could or should do in that cell. B, and then depending on what happens, we go further, we do uh, a due diligence on the transaction. Have you done any due diligence, blah, blah, blah? What have you done? What have you seen? Can you, and I have, I have specified a very, a very simple, but very uh, helpful questionnaire about what the people, the sponsor has done on this, on this deal, and then if nothing has been done, then we will go and and go to the transaction itself <clears throat> and to the company, and but but try to do it uh, in cooperation with other people so that we 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 do it with a tailored approach depending on what the business of the company is, and we we want that to try to have the management and certainly not to, to be an additional burden by multiple you know, questionnaire that would be totally uh, non-consistent and so on. So as far as front invest is concerned, well, that's what we've done. GP and LP is on the equity side, go possibly on the debt side now to, to see what can be done. And we have a third thing, and this is your second question, is how do we do on a given deal between debt providers and, uh, and, and sponsors? I've told you what we do as a company, LBO France, and that's how I, I answered your questions regarding the report when, when we discussed. But at the France Invest level, again, we have set up a group which is made of a few equity sponsors and a few debt uh, providers, of fund managers, and together we are working on a recommendation now that is going to be very simple. It could be a three-page thing, not more, um, saying how should we together approach. We have the same goal. We want the chain of trust. We want to go on material things. We want to help management and not be a burden. So how do we do? And the recommendation that we're working on together is to say that on a given deal, before we do a deal, all, all the people should cooperate to see how they are going to manage the ESG issue at the time of the deal, during during the holding period, and and then and then the step, uh, the next step. And so that's what. Uh, we, we, we work on today and say what happens if the sponsor has done a due diligence, what happens if the sponsor has not done a due diligence, what should be an annual, an annual reporting. And for instance, we will say that the annual reporting that uh, debt funds and banks should, uh, would have should be an extract of what the sponsor is, is, is doing. And we want to be sure that people cope with this before uh, so that afterwards uh, there is no no many questionnaires coming directly to management, and of course if there is a major incident at the company, then we see how we communicate, we negotiate it. It should go through the board and to all all the people and so on. So that's what we're doing. Sorry, I, I was long. Well, not at all. Um, thank you so much for that. Again, a lot of insight there. Sorry. Pleased that we've got. Um, and a lot of uh, a lot of people on the line today, and, and hopefully learning a lot, and a good range of investors, a lot of funds on board. 
I've got a couple more questions for our panelists. But I see that, um, that we've also got questions coming in from the audience. Um, and just a reminder, if you can't see the Q&A box, just click on the question mark at the bottom of your screen. It should come up in the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Just type in there. I won't, I won't say any names of people asking questions unless they put the name in the question. Um, so thematic in investments, impact investment, SDGs come up a lot at the moment. Um, and I just wonder if I could come back to Dandra and ask you a question as the asset owner on the panel. Um, Dandra, how important is, is impact in the, in the broadest sense of the term to nest in your considerations when, um, when looking to, to hire a manager or indeed for, for your broader investment strategy? Um, I'll, I'll be honest, it's not front and centre. Um, you know, what, what we're concerned about is, is ESG risk management and seeking out ESG opportunities that could enhance investment returns. Um, we're very interested in pushing the market forward on impact um, and, you know, ensuring that the, the industry comes to, uh, you know, a taxonomy and a definition that everyone agrees on. Um, and I think the, the definition of impact has, has evolved of late and, and how we see it and how we think about impact within our investment approach is if, if we can move into impact um, investments that still meet our risk return requirements, then we absolutely welcome that. Um, mm -hmm. what, what we won't do at the moment is you know, sacrifice um, financial return or take on more risk in order to, to embark on an impact investment. Um, having said that, within you know infrastructure debt, for example, and um, I think the, the uh, I think Richard said you know that that particular sub asset class is absolutely ripe for impact investment, and it's really great to see that you know social infrastructure renewables is, is actually a really important part of the investment opportunity set. So um, we've been having you know really interesting conversations with fund managers about these types of assets within that space. And how they see their portfolios evolving, you know, to sort of having more of those types of social impact and environmental impact assets within their portfolios, and we absolutely welcome that. We think it's it's absolutely um, aligned with our RI approach. For example, um, renewables um, as a climate aware investor, that's where we're moving towards, and that's part of our RI approach and our investment approach. So. We absolutely are steering fund managers towards more renewables and less carbon intensive assets. Mm -hmm. um, we also, you know, given our UK membership, who, um, you know, our, UK, our members are amongst the lowest earners in society, so social housing is absolutely something as well that, that, that we welcome um, to be part of our investment opportunity set. <coughs> so we're, we're really pleased that this is part of the proposition and we, we really want to have those things in our portfolio, um, but really because it, it, it's a great financial story. It's a great long-term story as well. We're long-term investors. Um, and, you know, it, it just those assets at the moment are just chiming in, you know, in, in the direction of, you know, in the direction of the way the world is going. And we, we want to be part of that story. Um, so we are potentially looking at, you know, thinking about having targeted allocations in those assets, but we really don't want to restrict the investment flexibility of our fund managers to, you know, meet our risk return requirements. But I think private debt, we, we're quite happy to say that um, these assets are very much part of the risk return story, So, mm -hmm. which is uh, an absolute bonus and, and a you know, great advantage for us as an asset owner. Yeah. Excellent, Diandra. Thank you for that. That's very helpful. Um, we have some questions streaming in from the audience, so thank you. I'm going to ask one of my own and combine that with one of these questions. Um, but maybe if I could just ask uh, Richard here to sort of add to that response. And, but <coughs> any asset owner or, or um, manager questioning the, the relationship between investments that have a positive impact associated with them and returns. Um, and there's a question that's come in from the audience, which I'm going to combine with this. What is your opinion on the importance of sustainable loans in this matter, such as positive impact loans, um, green loans, and products that already integrate ESG considerations? Okay, uh, I, I think um, 
when you're looking at, at, at impact investment for, for mainstream institutional investors, uh, you absolutely have to focus on on risk and return just as much as as, as impact, and uh, that's that's what um, we've embedded into into our approach. Now, historically, some impact funds have been uh, quite small niche products, uh, which which may focus more on impact than returns. But but um, that's really been the the um, the domain of, of of high net worth and um, and family office type investment who who who, who can make that trade off. But but if you're trying to grow impact market uh, the impact market into an institutional size market, which is really what we we really need to do to 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 actually have an impact and and make a difference, then you you need to focus just as much on 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 risk and return. Now um, now we believe that the private debt markets as as well as being a a, a lovely market to find impact investment is also a great market to um, to find attractive returns. So uh, you 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 you're, you're um, uh, I guess investing in more illiquid investments, and, and, and because of that, you, you, you normally get a return premium over, over similar risks in public markets. So, so by investing privately, you, you, you are, you're all automatically starting starting with a, with a premium over public markets. Um, but, but I think um, what's very important if, in, 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 in this space is, 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 is yes, you, you don't want to restrict your investment universe too far, uh, because then you do, you do run into issues in terms of diversification and in terms of maximizing return. So, so, so we advocate um, a very broad uh, approach to impact investment in private markets to, to allow investment in, in infrastructure debt, in direct lending and real estate debt, in, in, in private ABS, in, 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 in all corners of private markets in order to, to, to get that diversity of, of, of assets to build sensible institutional size portfolios uh, and, and also diversity of impact. Richard, thank you for that. I'm going to go into quick fire mode here because we've got a lot of questions coming in. I want to ask a couple of questions to both Chris and Mark. Um, and this really relates to your relationships as an investor with companies. Um, so I want to hear a bit about what your experience has been with engaging um, investee companies with borrowers on ESG, so what is their reaction to you asking questions about ESG, particularly some of the smaller businesses that you're uh, interacting with? Um, and to add to that, do you, a question come in from the audience, do you incorporate ESG-related covenants in loan agreements? Um, and if so, could you provide an example? Um, but I'll start with Chris and then same questions to Mark, if I may. Sure. Um, so. Um, on, you know, I'd like to just add to to SG, SDG and impact. I mean, we're not impact uh, investors uh, per se, um, you know, but we do care about the negative and positive impact that our borrowers might have on people in the environment. Um, we care about sustainability and, and have taken steps to consider the contribution of our investment activity to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. For example, you know, with Naveen's support, we screen all of our deals for alignment with SDGs to better track and understand our potential impact on sustainable development. And in the future, we'll explore how we can use this information to, you know, to inform our understanding of sustainability and, and, and in our investment process. So I just thought, you know, we were, we're active in that spot, and I just thought I'd just add to that. Um, with respect to, you know, engaging, um, our companies and, and sponsors around ESG, um, you know, we're lenders, um, you know, we're not owners or equity investors in the companies, you know, so we really, um, you know, don't have a say um, or can't direct them with respect to ESG challenges um, and, and risks, um, you know, but I, as said before, we're obviously incorporating that you know, in our investment decisions, um, you know, and to the extent that we have ESG-related issues that we uncover, um, you know, during due diligence, you, you know, we'll, we'll, we can tr add specific covenants if necessary, you know, that could get around, you know, the monitoring of those, um, you know, those issues um, and how, you know, we're, we're taking corrective action or, trying to drive the company to take 
um, you know, corrective action with respect to those issues. Um, you know, all of our loan agreements have pretty um, strict affirmative and negative covenants, you know, that really um, can, will get to ESG-related issues. Uh, you know, there's notice provisions, there's disclosure provisions. Um, you know, so we're, you know, the bar is required to let us know of material issues, um, and that would be, you know, that, that would be uh, maybe an ESG-related issue. Um, and that then takes less us, you know, engage with them to see, um, you know, how they're addressing the issue. And, uh, you know, and we, you know, we can try to drive, um, you know, that a little bit. Uh, but again, you know, we're, we're lenders, not owners. Um, you know, so only so much we can do outside of the default uh, that, that occurs. Okay, so Chris, thank you. Mark, I wonder if you could add any insights and experiences you've had engaging with interacting with lenders, I'm uh, sorry, with borrowers, and um, and uh, perhaps, you know, there, there, there is some uh, terminology, some terms for covenants that we uh, put into the report based on um, input from, from some of the French signatories that contributed to the report. So in, any further insight you could provide on that would be great. So I would I would I would uh, join Chris. Um, a as uh, you know, it's it's amazing because when we are equity people, we are very very demanding, and and ESG issues are even signed in shareholders' agreements. So how we are going to monitor what people are going to say that it has to be discussed that we uh, with is in both very and there are two stages. There are one stage, which is the a philosophy approach, which is, you know, we are very keen on the ESG issue, so we, we, we want to be sure that we're fine, that we align, that, uh, and what ESG means. And people know it because we've made due diligences, we've met all the people, and so on. And then, so, and then we have very, very precise clauses in shareholders' agreements saying, how, it, how is things should happen. Now, when we are lenders, then we, uh, once again, we, we will cover the issue through the, what I said is exactly what Chris pointed out, through the due diligence approach, which can be in three steps, as I said, and which might result in our not investing. It has happened in, in equity, it has happened in debt, and we are very, you know I mean, we, we pull off, no problem. And we've done it already. Uh, then afterwards, our say today is little, apart from the fact that we don't have any specific ESG uh, covenants, but we have general governance. Uh, you know, we, we have clauses in, in contracts saying if major issues happen, and we should be we should be aware. And of course, there are many many clauses on information, and some of the issue might be ESG issues. Now I go back to what I said earlier. We are today working on a recommendation um, at the level of France Invest between equity sponsors and debt funds or banks, uh, a recommendation on A, what the approach should be, and I've explained it so I don't come back to it, but we, it will end up by uh, uh, providing a general uh, close that should be uh, included in contracts about ESG issues and uh, on, on, on in contract of, uh, of a borrowing contract that uh, we, we are working with between sponsors, debt providers, and lawyers to say, okay, if we agree on the approach on what it should be on the deal, then we can have this kind, of, this kind, this kind, this kind of of closing the contract we are when we are working on, and I'm sure that at some point, someday, it will end up with uh, having covenants uh, really related to more more than today it's commitments. Tomorrow it will be covenants, and I'm, and it will end up at the end, uh, the, in my view, from an econ economic point of view, that at some point the interest rate rate might depend. Uh, on ESG-connected risks. 
Mark, thank you for that. I'm going to try one more question. We have only a few minutes left, and I want to wrap up briefly. Um, there's a question here directed to, to Richard. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase this. Um, in respect of syndicated leverage loans, is it difficult to get access to information um, that you may want from um, arranging banks or uh, private equity sponsors um, that you're not able to currently get the finding that they're not cooperative? And how might you be dealing with those barriers to get access to quali quality information around specific ESG factors? <coughs> Yeah, I guess um, as, as I sort of started right at the beginning of the call, the private debt market is is quite diverse, and and uh, the leverage loan market is, um, I, I guess, the part of private debt market which is which is kind of sits in between the uh, traditional direct lending type of private debt and public market. So it has it has some characteristics of both. So um, I, I think it is it, you still generally have better access to to companies in most cases than than, than you do in in, in 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 public markets especially if you develop a relationship um uh, over time um because it is a private market um then then you can uh, companies are often, um, you know, more willing to have um, uh, discussions with you about 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 the issues that that, that matter to you because um, they, they they don't fall under the same disclosure regulations as private com as, as public companies. Um, you now, uh, if if you are a, a a large player in this market, then 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 you're continually doing. Uh, transactions with which with the same large private equity firms so so you develop a relationship with them and get to know their uh, their their ESG views and uh, over time and 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 they, they they try to be helpful to 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 get the information you want because it's they're not looking at just this deal they're looking at the next deal and the next deal and the next deal so so again you, you build relationships with the with the PE houses just as much as you do with the companies so 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 I think um, yeah I, I, the 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 level of access in that market probably sits in between the the, the very uh, very very close relationship you have on bilateral transactions where it's just you and the company and, and and public markets, but 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 still quite a good level of access built on relationships over time. Richard, thank you so much. I'm going to now wrap up very quickly. This hour has gone very quickly indeed. Uh, I want to say a huge thank you first of all to Diandra, Richard, Chris and Mark for your contributions, your time. I've learned a lot um, and I'm sure we'd happily go on for another hour. But, um, please do look out for the recording. If you've got any further questions, do send them in. Um, just put up some contact details on the screen here for you if I can. Um, thank you to all of you on the line for joining us. It's been a very well attended webinar. I need to say a huge thank you to Felix Solner and our amazing communications team here at PRI for working on the report that we will send around to you, published last week. This is actually my last official duty at PRI before I move on to a new role to work with one of our signatories, Musenich, uh, which is a, a US credit manager, but I will be based here in London, so I hope to keep in touch with many of you. Um, I also want to say a huge thank you to all the signatories we work with on the report itself uh, made a, a great contribution, um, thoroughly enjoyable process and I'm really pleased with the result. For any follow-ups, um, if you want to contribute a case study, work with us on that, something that we can put on our website alongside the report, um, please do get in touch with Felix. Uh, if you have any other questions or we haven't answered your questions today, we will put those to the speakers and, and try and get you answers via email. Um, and uh, as I say, we'll send you the link for the report with the follow-up on this webinar. Thank you all for joining. Have a great rest of the day, and uh, we'll be in touch.